what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yesterday, I opened the digital edition of the New York Times to a front page full of new insights, facts, and opinions alongside the newly released video evidence surrounding the recent death of Tyre Nichols at the hands of Memphis police. <clears throat> Within an hour, I saw numerous social media posts, email newsletters, and uh, messages from the various institutions I subscribe to lamenting the tragedy of Tyre's death and decrying the continued state of police violence which disproportionately targets the lives of people of color in this country. In the wake of such a tragedy, and it is that a heinous tragedy, tensions seem to rise once again, not just politically, but also spiritually. I read more than once in posts, messages, or letters yesterday that thoughts and prayers were with the family at this time and with the people of Memphis. And for every outpouring of the heart, for every prayer and thought uplifted, there seemed also to be a harsh critique which said, keep your thoughts and your prayers. We want action. We want justice. As I scrolled through social media earlier in the week, I came across a commentary offered by my seminary dean, Andrew McGowan, on this morning's scriptural reading from the prophet Micah. While not directly related to the news headlines, I feel his comments capture the fairly predominant sentiment I've just described. In his comments on today's scripture reading from the prophet, Dean McGowan remarked on the temptation for religious leaders, preachers, and congregants alike to hear in Micah's words a call to cease our work of worship, the lifting up of our thoughts and our hearts and our voices in the beauty of holiness, a call to abandon our communal liturgical prayerful worship of God in favor of what is perceived as a more dynamic, social justice-centered grassroots community of action. <clears throat> keep your thoughts. Keep your prayers. We want action. We want justice. As Dean McGowan wrote, the temptation is to say, God doesn't want our liturgies in the face of, sus of such injustice, God wants justice itself. But I believe that a dichotomy of such shallow simplicity could not be farther from what God has in store for us and for this world. Now, to be sure, it is certainly true that God wants justice in this world. That is not up for debate. The prophet Micah's words are indeed an all too familiar refrain amongst the people of God, which decries the unjust treatment of the poor and the disadvantaged during his time at the hands of the religious authorities and their enforcers of the law. Micah decries an unjust regime that has caused the people to bleed deep into their holy land, so much so that the collapse of the entire Jewish society, the entire community of God, would be imminent at the hands of yet another band of enforcers, the Assyrians, who loom to finish the destruction of God's beloved community as much as his own people already have done. Digging deeper into the prophet's words, we can understand them to lament the dishonest worship practices which impoverish the city of Jerusalem 
and tip the scales in favor of the privileged and wealthy members of society over those who live in poverty and are disadvantaged. The prophet is not denouncing worship altogether, but rather reminds us that worship, those thoughts and prayers and sacrifices, that worship is to be offered to God as our earthly proclamation and participation in God's vision for justice throughout creation, and not via a root of exploitation and greed. Likewise, the prophet reminds us that worship is the very mechanism through which God participates in the lives of the faithful by directing human hearts and minds through the power of the Spirit to a great renewal, a new community of love and justice in the world as much as it is above in heaven. The prophet makes this clear for us. We cannot separate God's call for us to pursue justice from our call to worship. Because when we worship God in the way that God teaches us, then we would see and know that what surrounds us right here and right now is meant to be a foretaste of that justice which only God has in store for us and all his beloved creation, that justice which only God can give to us. I think it's even fair to say that any claim that does not want our liturgies, our prayers, our hopes, our faithfulness is controversial to the very foundations of the justice movements that have shaped our country over the last century. It's worth noting that the quest of social justice in this country has often been bound up in the promise of that anointing spirit who continues to raise voices in every generation to proclaim good news to the poor, release to the captives, sight to the blind, and decrying the violence against and, and exploitation and murder of God's people. In times like these, when we are in shock, in horror, and in grief over the continued and senseless violence against people of color and loss of an innocent life, there is temptation to believe that none of our work here today matters, that we cannot possibly subscribe to a life of faith and truly be social justice warriors. And yet, I stand here to ask, what is the work of justice if not the work of liturgy, the work of the people, embodied prayers and cries born by wearied yet hopeful souls to breathe life and light and healing into a sinful and broken world. Look around you. What is this place where young and old are gathered together in humble thanks, if not one filled with justice? What is this community where people of different paths, cultures, and backgrounds are mutually called and loved and known if not one filled with justice? What is this moment where broken bodies are made whole, where hungry mouths are fed, where hands are joined with hearts alike, where all are welcome to see and hear a proclamation of God's vision for a humanity that flourishes and likewise have a share in its fulfillment, if not a moment of justice? What is the purpose the work and the accomplishment of this gathering, this communion moment, if it is not God's justice poured forth into the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. We must remember that when God said, this is my body given for you, the resounding echo, it was the recapitulation of every sorrowful cry every faithful prayer and every hopeful prophet voice raised up amidst God's people in the face of violence and injustice so that no body should be broken again, but every body made whole. We cannot walk away from the fact that, we, that when we are here, we gather to remember around this altar the life of a brown man 
who gave himself to death at the hands of the enforcers of, of the law, that this story looks a lot like what those videos showed happening on a street in Memphis and what countless others have experienced, not for years or decades, but for centuries in this country and even longer around the world. We cannot walk away also from the legacy of those who witnessed and preserved, persevered to tell the story of a brown man from Nazareth that did not give death the final word. Here in this story, there is life, and that life should give us hope and strength and courage in the midst of our very present rage and grief to carry on and work to remind the world that we are not doomed to violence, destruction, and death, but meant for peace, renewal, and beautiful life abundant. If we walk away from all of this, if we say that God does not want our liturgy, our prayers, and our worship in the face of injustice, then we have not only stripped away the very substance and nature of God that binds God's justice to this earthly realm, but we have also shunned every hopeful beacon and faithful vision of those who have gone before us in this struggle. Perhaps walking humbly with our God in the pursuit of justice does not mean abandoning our faithful practices, but calls us to remember that what is made real by our worship in this place is not only the gift and promise of God's hope and call to each of us to enter into his very reign of justice, but also the gift of grace, of strength, and of courage, which will take us there through Christ around the altar and in the streets, our renewal only comes from our thankful memory of that boy from Nazareth. In our memory to his life and legacy, we do not walk away because we are called instead again to offer up our own lives, our own labors to the transforming work of God, who alone accomplishes true justice in this world and by the grace of his Son, seals it here upon our hearts and in our lips and in our deeds. Indeed, there is temptation here to misuse the prophet's words and fall into the trap of not only forgetting who God is and what God does for us in this world, but also in forgetting what God asks of us in our lives as his believers in the world. Let us be mindful so as not to be ensnared by the unfortunate conflation of hearing God's call for justice as a call to strip away the blessed memory and most holy presence through which he and his reign of justice is now known to us. All in all, we must be certain to remember that God here among us is the ultimate source of justice and not we ourselves. Our response then should be one of humble prayer worship, and witness so that we might hear his cries to and for us and take our place in his midst as he seeks to renew the face of the earth. There is no clearer way to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God than by first beholding him who gave up his life so that no other lives should be lost and who comes to us again and again so that we might live our lives abundantly in justice and in peace. So let us pray then. Beloved brothers and sisters, may the Lord accept the sacrifice of our hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good, and for the good of all his holy world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.